A drop of rain in the desert for the crisis in Gaza after repeated failures to reach consensus at the United Nations Security Council, the UN General Assembly finally adopted by majority a non-binding resolution on Gaza on Friday, October the 27th. The resolution, tabled by Jordan on behalf of the Arab world, calls for an quote-unquote immediate, durable and sustained humanitarian truce and demands that all parties immediately and fully comply with their obligations under international law. An overwhelming majority of nations voted in favor of the resolution. 14 countries, including Israel and the United States, voted against, while 45 countries abstained. Yet hours later, Israel announced Israeli forces have unleashed the second phase of the Gaza war, pressing ground operations against Hamas targets. We are only at the start, the Israeli Prime Minister Minister Netanyahu told the world. The ground operations followed heavy bombing of Gaza, which led to a communications blackout on Friday. How will the situation develop in the days and weeks to come? How divided is the world on the situation? Welcome to The Point, an opinion show coming to you live from Beijing. I'm Li Xin. I'm pleased to be joined from Wuhan, central China, by Jose Renato Penelupi, Jr., a fellow at the think tank Center for China and Globalization. From Shanghai, by Zhang Chu Chu, professor at the School of International Relations and Public Affairs and deputy director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at Fudan University. And also from Shanghai, by Professor Joseph Mahoney at East China Normal University the warmest welcome to all of you. Before we go into our deliberations, let's first take a closer look at the contents of this resolution, which was the first document that the world um, is able to come to some kind of agreement by and large. It says that expressing grave concern at the latest escalation of violence since October the 7th, attack and the grave deterioration of the situation in the region, in particular in the Gaza Strip and the rest of the occupied Palestinian authority territory, including East Jerusalem and in Israel, condemning all acts of violence aimed at Palestinian and Israeli civilians, including all acts of terrorism and indiscriminate attacks, the resolution calls for an immediate, durable and sustainable hum humanitarian truce, leading to a cessation of the hostilities. It demands that all parties immediately and fully comply with their obligations under international law, particularly in regard to the protection of civilians and civilian objects, and to enable and facilitate humanitarian access for essential supplies and services to reach all civilians in need in the Gaza Strip. First of all, let me go to um, Professor Mahoney, maybe, to take a look at the overall picture. Uh, what does the result of the voting tell us about the attitude of the international community? Well, first, just a quick note. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Iraq has claimed that they had a malfunction with their voting device and that they intended to vote uh, for the resolution. And uh, the UN uh, General Assembly has confirmed uh, uh, that, that Iraq uh, uh, should be regarded as having officially supported uh, uh, the position. So in that case, all Arab countries have in fact supported the, uh, the resolution. Mm -hmm. Now, with regard to uh, the, the broader um, picture of how we see uh, the voting, uh, clearly we have, um, uh, most of the world, including most of the, of the global south, as well as the emerging and developing countries, as you noted, uh, that have supported this. Um, what's interesting, of course, are the are the abstentions and uh, why we're seeing uh, uh, so many abstentions in um, Europe, uh, why uh, India abstained and so forth and so on. And, and there's a lot to, uh, to be discussed in this. Um, uh, we know why the U.S. supported. We can understand why maybe some of the small countries in the South Pacific supported in so much as they are are uh, part of certain voting blocks and, and networks uh, uh, dependent on aid. Um, but why why did we see uh, so many European countries uh, abstaining? 
Uh, why do we see India abstaining? These are these are much more we, interesting questions, I think. Yeah, we'll get to that in just a moment. But first of all, can we say, can we extrapolate that the great majority of countries in the world want to see an immediate ceasefire? Can we say that, uh, Professor Mahoney? I think it's absolutely the case that, that most people would not only like to see a ceasefire, like, they would like to see a durable uh, solution to this problem that has been going on for decades and has long been a flashpoint not only for uh, cruelty and injustice, uh, but, but for broader conflicts in the region. Mm -hmm. Professor Zhang, how do you look at the voting result with um, Professor Mahoney's clarification, which I appreciate a great deal? The number should be 121 countries voted in favor of this resolution, 44 countries voted in abstention, and 14 countries voted against. Yeah, actually, um, first of all, as we have just discussed, um, actually, like, like most of the countries, um, they are in favor of this resolution. And that actually proves that most of the countries doesn't want to um, really see an escalation of the conflict. And the second issue is that when we talk about um, the Palestine-Israel conflict, we have to take into consideration, um, first of all, um, for instance, within the United Nations, the United States has its own proposal. But does it really work to solve the problem? And the second thing is, how can the other countries benefit from just siding with the United States? Um, so like for, for China, actually, we know that past empirical evidence shows that whatever the outcomes of the ongoing armed conflict, further violence is not going to be prevented if you don't look at the fundamental solutions. Um, Right, and even if there is an eventual ceasefire between the two sides of the conflict, the shadow um, of the conflict may still linger. So even when the United States promoted the Abraham Accords in the past, China has also insisted that we cannot bypass and just marginalize the core disputes between Palestine and Israel. And that is why China has uh, the coherent position that the two-state resolution is the fundamental way out of the Israel-Hamas mm. conflict. Well, let's take a closer look at China's position after the voting. Uh, China voted yes to this resolution. China's uh, represent, permanent representative to the United Nations says China welcomes the adoption of the resolution, which reflects the strong call of the majority of member states for a ceasefire and an end to the war. Mr. Zhang Jun says China hopes that this resolution will be fully implemented and China highly appreciates and will continue to firmly support the leading role played by Arab and Islamic countries on the Palestinian issue. Um, Professor Mahoney, how do you look at China's position there? Um, has China's stance been persistent on this issue? I think it has been, and, and I, I think if we go back to um, uh, earlier this year, we saw China even offering to try to help mediate uh, this uh, long-standing conflict between uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians uh, through the context of its uh, global security initiative, uh, recalling that it, it uh, that was instrumental in helping uh, to resolve some of the differences between Riyadh and, and Tehran and was also providing a, frame, a framework for China to, to try to mediate uh, the conflict in Ukraine. So I think it, not just in the case of, of the conflict in Israel, but, but in terms of uh, all conflicts that we're seeing around the world now, China has laid out a very clear position, uh, some very clear principles, and uh, is, is advancing uh, by virtue of those principles. Has China's uh, position, Professor Zhang, been coherent also besides being the same or long? Professor Zhang. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, it was not very clear. Uh, yeah. please, uh, well, how do you look at China's position? Do you think China's position has been coherent and persist and the same, remain the same throughout the time on this issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, from my uh, point of view, yes, I think that uh, China has always been like coherent and we are very straightforward because we know um, that no matter how the world, the situation is changing, we know that if you don't look at the real issue and the fundamental problem um, of the Israel-Palestine conflict, the conflict is not going to end. Uh, and like I have just mentioned, even if before, um, like 
th this time, why has um, Hamas just launched an attack? And like one of the contexts is that the uh, United States is going to promote um, the normalization between Saudi Arabia and its Israel uh, without considering the issue of Palestine. And we know the issue, and that is why we have always um, been insistent on um, the two-state resolution. Let's take a look at uh, the abstention votes, which um, could be about 45, actually, if uh, Iraq's vote will be counted as uh, um, for this resolution, then it's 44 countries voted voting in abstention of this uh, resolution. They include the UK, Germany, Canada, Austria, Japan, Italy, Netherlands, Finland, Poland and India. Um, it is very interesting that they have uh, pretty much unanimously expressed the idea that they are disappointed with the draft's omission of an unequivocal condemnation of Hamas's attack. Professor Mahoney, why do you think the resolution stopped short of calling out, of condemning Hamas, although it does condemn all acts of violence aimed at Palestinian and Israeli civilians? Well, you know, first of all, let's consider why there were so many abstentions in Europe. And I think what we've seen uh, accelerating over the past uh, several days is this greater public backlash in many European countries about uh, disproportionate uh, Israeli violence against Palestinians, on top of concerns that uh, Israel has long intentionally frustrated the two-state solution and continued uh, to build settlements and occupied territories uh, while perpetually holding uh, the Palestinian territories as restricted ghettos, uh, what the UN uh, General Secretary described as uh, 56 years of uh, suffocating uh, occupation uh, and noting that the Hamas attacks uh, uh, did not occur in a vacuum. Uh, that said, uh, you know, several of those abstaining justified their position, uh, as you note, uh, by saying that the re resolution should have condemned Hamas uh, explicitly. Uh, despite uh, condemning attacks on civilians by both sides. And I think that the key issue is, um, you know, there are two sides to this issue. Um, there have always been two sides to this issue. And uh, again, it's not taking place in a vacuum. Um, I think condemning uh, the initial civilian tax attacks is certainly something that's explicitly uh, intended in this resolution. But this isn't about uh, condemning Hamas or the Israeli state. It's about con uh, condemning uh, the violence that is killing uh, innocent civilians. And I don't know why that's so complicated for a lot of uh, European uh, countries to embrace or the others who abstain. Do you think then that this, this saying that because the resolution does not name Hamas, then these European countries cannot vote in support of a ceasefire, do you think that's a real reason or just an excuse, Professor Mahoney? You know, I think it's an excuse. I think that the uh, public opinion is divided in in uh, European countries. And of course, uh, the, uh, the, uh, Hungary, and, and I, I don't recall if, if other European countries uh, actually supported or, 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 or voted against. Um, but Well, as uh, I, as know, I said, matter, for instance, UK, Germany, Canada, Austria, Japan, uh, Italy, ne the Netherlands, Finland, Poland, these are the major European countries that voted in abstention. And then we also see Japan and India in Asia, for instance, voting in abstention as well. Professor Mahoney, for your information. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, think they're, I think they're just trying to avoid taking uh, responsibility for a very complicated issue. Uh, they don't want to alienate uh, Israel. They don't want to alienate uh, the United States, and uh, they want to avoid picking a fight with the Arab world. And I think this goes back to your earlier point and my colleague at, at Udon about China's position being coherent, uh, but also morally based. You know, China has close relations with Israel, but it also has close relations um, with the Arab world, and it has a positive regard of the Palestinian people. Uh, and as a result, it has taken the, the strong clear moral position of saying, stop killing uh, civilians, stop uh, advancing a conflict that is disproportionately killing civilians, women and children. That's a very clear, uh, painful statement to make. It will alienate uh, perhaps China uh, from Tel Aviv, but it's the right thing to do. And, and for whatever reason, uh, these European countries, because of divided public opinion or their own uh, uh, foreign policy, uh, whether they're beholden in some way to the United States or not, uh, 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 this is this is where they've gone off track. 
Professor Zhang, how do you look at the abstention vote of India, for instance? Indian Prime Minister um, Narendra Modi immediately condemned the attacks on Israel on October the 7th, and yet, and India now uh, voting in abstention, calling for a ceasefire. And India also quoted um, was. Uh, quoted the, 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 the fact that this resolution did not condemn Hamas as a terrorist organization for the reason why India did not support this resolution. How do you look at India's stance? Um, so first of all, um, I totally agree with uh, what Professor Macroni has just mentioned. Um, so India, first of all, is just like the European countries. Um, so um, it doesn't want to really, you know, take sides in this very complicated issue. Um, but beyond that, we know that actually in recent years, India is trying to play a bigger role in the Middle East. So sometimes we are saying the Middle East is looking east, and the east is not just including China, but also like the, all the other big powers in the region, including uh, India and Japan. And the issue is that right now India is trying to uh, approach Israel like uh, we have seen in recent years. It has developed really good relations with um, Israel, including a lot of like uh, commercial um, interactions are ongoing. So really in this case, uh, actually India doesn't want to just displease Israel. Uh, and plus, it is a good ally of the United States at some point. Uh, but at the same time, you know, India has a large Muslim population. Uh, and right now, um, again, in India, the public opinion is also like polarized and it doesn't want to um, cause trouble for itself. And that is why um, we can see an abstention this time. Hmm. Let me try to reach out to my to my guest uh, in, Shanghai, in Shanghai once again, Professor Mahoney. And let's take a look at uh, the perspective of uh, other major developing countries, probably Brazil, Russia. And we are looking at, uh, um, you know, the uh, heavyweights, uh, South Africa as well, and African countries mostly voting for this resolution. But how much will their voice be heeded by the main actors here, Israel and the United States behind his back? Well, you know, in fact, uh, uh, Israel has generally turned a deaf ear to the UN uh, and the international community when it comes to uh, this conflict with the Palestinians. And it should be noted that the US, which is uh, ultimately uh, Israel's uh, steadfast, uh, steadfast uh, supporter on the uh, UN uh, Security Council, likewise ignores the UN uh, whenever it wants. Now. Uh, with uh, uh, Israel now saying that we'll ban U.S. Represent, uh, U.N. representatives from visiting Israel and calling for the general secretary's uh, re resignation, I think you know it, it raises uh, this this um, this uh, uh, narrative that many people uh, in, in the rest of the world that, that have. Uh, uh, in, in the countries that have uh, the voted thing is, for this resolution. Yeah, Professor Mahoney. Yeah, I on. mean, um, the U.S. would say, look. We, this is a non-binding resolution, so the United States and Israel have the right to disregard it. Professor Mahoney, how, how, how are you going yeah, to I don't, I don't, I don't think. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that's what we're seeing. I think what we've seen is U.S. military personnel in Israel uh, uh, advising Israel uh, on the conflict. We've seen U.S. Uh, um, um, uh, fighters uh, striking positions in Syria. Uh, we've seen U.S. politicians uh, taking a very powerful uh, uh, stand on behalf of uh, uh, Israel. Uh, we see uh, a tremendous amount of the U.S. population that uh, very much uh, supports uh, the Israeli position, uh, whatever it is. Uh, so I don't think, uh, and, and of course, as I just said, uh, we, ha we have Israel saying that uh, they, they totally uh, reject uh, this resolution and uh, they won't let the, the U.N. now visit the country. And they think uh, that uh, the general secretary should resign. So it's not simply that they're uh, choosing to ignore a non-binding uh, resolution. Uh, in fact, what they're choosing to do is is to deliberately attack it, and likewise to deliberately attack and expand the conflict. On the other hand, uh, Professor Zhang, let me come to you. Regardless of what Israel does on the ground, Israel is reacting to a resolution that it opposes, and the UN General Assembly resolution is not 
binding. It doesn't have the kind of legal force as a UN Security Council resolution. So in that way, Israel will say, look, I have the right to disagree. I, I do not, I voted against it. I'm still part of the United Nations, so I still have the right to, to disregard this resolution, they would say. Right. And, uh, yeah, and actually, this is a very interesting question. And indeed, you cannot force a state actor to just follow a resolution of the United Nations um, General Assembly. But this does not mean that it is not important. So first of all, the results of the vote reflect a sense of popular um, support and international recognition. And in fact, if you look at um, the result, like 120 countries are in favor of the resolution. And this already means something. This already creates pressure of uh, public opinion and diplomatic pressure on Israel. So I would say that international recognition is very important to Israel. And that is why you see that Israel, it criticizes the resolution. If it doesn't care, then it doesn't need to do so. Uh, and another issue is that it also creates pressure on the United States uh, because it means that you cannot do whatever you want as long as um, you have power. It is no longer the logic in international politics. And also the United States has always uh, uh, talked about the democratic values, then how about democratization of international relations? So what are you going to do when so many countries are in favor of this resolution? So you can see that today, uh, even the United States, it feels the pressure. And like President Biden, it has held talks um, with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and says that we have to make a distinction, a differentiation between the Israeli, um, uh, no, the uh, Hamas mm -hmm. and Palestinian uh, civilians. Yeah. Well, um, let me try to reach out to our guest in Wuhan, Renato. Uh, let me ask you this question. Now, Israel is saying uh, it acknowledges there are civilian casualties, women and children, but it's not targeting civilian uh, objects. There's a difference between people dying as a, as a site effect, an, an unfortunate collateral damage, if I can use that word here, and targeting them deliberately. What is your reaction to that? Well, um, as we can see, like the, the decision of the General Assembly uh, follows the United Nations guiding principles to protect, to respect, to remedy. Whatever is the position of Israel or Palestine, the first step now is to make sure that everything is okay with all the civilians. So open room, giving space, and I think the ceasefire will be a good step for us to understand what is going on, really be sure about the, the number of deaths or civilians that are still alive, and make room for them to leave the, the conflict zone. So we are working for this two-state solution, and I think that's the basilar discussion. So whatever like Israel is presenting or positioning itself, open and following the definition of the United Nations would be a good space for everybody to be sure and feel secure about it. Let's take a look at uh, the, the, the casualty number. Um, Gaza Health Ministry says there are unprecedented 8,000 plus people, mostly women and children and minors who have died and the actual number could be higher and uh, it is uh, seen, it is reported that it has released a, a 200 plus document with names and identity and gender, for instance, of those who have died. Meanwhile, Israeli side have also suffered unprecedented death number. Over 1,400 people died, mostly on October uh, the 7th, because of the attacks, the sudden attacks by Hamas on its population. Um, Professor Mahoney, how do you look at the some people questioning the credibility of the Palestinian numbers here? Well, you know, I think in, in these times of conflict, certainly uh, it, it's difficult to, to be absolutely certain uh, how many people have been killed. Uh, but I think what we've seen in the past is that uh, uh, the Palestinians have generally been reliable when reporting uh, the number of people killed, that they don't generally pad uh, the numbers. And uh, I think it's probably fair uh, to assume that uh, uh, thousands of people have died, uh, uh, disproportionately uh, women and children. Uh, above all, given the intensity uh, of the bombardment that we've seen from the Israeli side. Professor Zhang, um, how do you look 
at uh, those questioning the credibility, saying they have no confidence in the numbers, despite uh, both the UN Agency for Palestine Refugees have uh, spoken uh, about these numbers, and the WHO's chief for emergency programs have also come out and saying these numbers are uh, either um, in terms of track record or in terms of uh, the level they are reflecting the actual situation on the ground, that these numbers are by and large, I would say, credible. Um, yeah, first of all, I totally agree with um, my, what my colleague has just mentioned. Uh, well, yes, uh, during a war, you cannot just um, be very clear and sure like uh, what exactly is the number. And the thing is, of course, there are like um, disputes um, and like um, different sides are going to justify their own actions. And that is why um, they are making a story of this kind of like number issues. Um, but what we can be sure is that there is a human humanitarian crisis. I mean, if you look at the video of uh, what is going on now, it's a disaster there that is uh, that we can be sure about. And also we can be sure about um, a lot of like civilians, they really suffer. And like in Gaza Strip, a lot of people, they don't, they can't access to their food um, and thousands of people are dying. And, and does it like, is, is there really a great difference between even uh, if it's like 9,000 people are dying or 8,000? I mean, totally, we can just say that, yes, people are suffering. Um, and at the same time, we also have to know that um, actually now um, one tactic um, of the you know ground war maybe um, that they are going to um, like drive the Gaza people into like specific areas and in that case um, like they are suffering and um, the local people um, they cannot um, you know get enough space for their living and that is another issue that we should be worried about. Renato, how do you look at the humanitarian situation developing in the days to come as Gaza has uh, started ground operations to elim eliminate Hamas? Yeah, it's a very serious and like very sad situation. Once you face a city with more than two million people isolated, like between desert and sea, and face it walls and bombs, so like every hour people are dying, especially kids and women. And we're supposed to like intervene somehow to make sure that the civilians will be all right. I think this humanitarian like situation, it's really plays against like Israel in any any situation because not looking for like this this like vulnerable people, this like people that has nowhere to run, like only hide on this like the the scratches of like buildings and like. This terrible situation is is just increasing hour by hour, and as my colleagues already said, like there, there is nothing to to be done but like to stop the conflict as soon as we can, and like we start to support at least the civilians, and and then see what, what we can debate and what can how can we understand this conflict. This two-state solution is a step to go, but as I already said, like we gotta prevail and protect and respect and remedy the situation of civilians. Uh, looking for the human rights of everyone, and, and especially like those civilians, they are there, like uh, unprotected and and with no nowhere to run. Professor Mahoney, how bloody will things be uh, when Israeli ground forces enter Gaza in search of Hamas? Well, I think we expect it to be much worse than it than it currently is. But to, to be honest with you, I'm hearing. Uh, that, that there are some uh, Israeli commanders who are concerned that uh, there's no exit strategy. Like once you go in, uh, there's no way to get out and there's no political solution. So uh, how long this could go on, uh, what sort of occupation, what type of uh, martial law might be imposed there if they do go completely in uh, remains to be seen. But we could be talking about a problem that goes on for years and that claims tens of thousands of lives. We are going to leave it there. Uh, a very sad topic, but we have to keep talking about it. Many thanks to my guests, Sir Jose Renato Penelupi joining us from Wuhan, Professor Zhang Chu Chu joining us from Shanghai, and Professor Joseph Mahoney. The, thank you very much for your insights. With that, we come to the end of this special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin, coming to you from Beijing. As always, on behalf of the whole team, thank you for joining us. You've got The Point.